As we know that Jesus Christ is the good shepherd, he said in the book of John chapter 10, verse 11, that he said, I am the good shepherd and I lay down my life and I give my life to the sheep. And also he said, I am the good shepherd in verse 14, chapter 10 of the book of John, that I, that I know my sheep and am known by my own. So as a Christians living in New Testament era, we quite well understand that our Jesus is a good shepherd. He laid down his own life for you and I, and he knows every one of us, every single detail of ours he knows because he has infinite knowledge and he has infinite wisdom and counsel. But also, King David, even though he lived in Old Testament era, he understood his God as not only the Lord and the Master, but also he knew him as good shepherd. That's why our most renowned and famous psalm written by King David is Psalm 23, and he said, The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not lack. So we know our God is not only the creator God, and he is our Lord and our master, but also from the scriptures, even from Old Testament, that we know our God is the shepherd. So we can address our God as God the shepherd. And the shepherd feeds, leads, provides, protects, and also, he comforts his sheep. That's something we are going to dive in to the Word of God to understand who he is, that he is the shepherd, and he comforts his sheep. And he is the God who has infinite power and wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And that truth truly comforts us. And also, because he is an infinite, all-powerful shepherd, he also empowers his sheep, and he strengthens his sheep, and also he renews his sheep. And this aspect that we are going to look at by examining the chapter 40 of the book of Isaiah, and I know we are not there yet, but because this coming weekend, we have a guest speaker, and most likely he will not be talking about the book of Isaiah in that detail. So I thought to just go ahead and read further and go to chapter 40 of the book of Isaiah. Now, to give us a little bit of background, the book of Isaiah is divided into two major sections. From chapter 1 to 39, the messages are messages of conviction and judgment and wrath of God. As we know, the Israelites continually rebelled against God and disobeyed God. So God used prophet Isaiah to bring about the announcement of judgment. So they became captivity to Babylonian kingdom. And not only that, the surrounding nations, God used them as a rod to chastise his own people, Israel, like Assyria and Babylon and Edomites and all these nations, they also received announcement of judgments. And that's up to chapter 39. But our God, his intention is not to only judge the people and discipline his people. His end goal is always hope and comfort and better future. So from chapter 40 until last chapter, which is chapter 66, that he will give us a message of comfort, hope. So that's good news. So that's where we are going to land on. From chapter 40, if you know the book of Isaiah, there will be a lot of prophecies of coming Messiah, the first coming, and also as well as the second coming, and the millennium, and the new heaven, and new earth. 
So we will be edified. And personally, I enjoy reading the book of Isaiah, especially from chapter 40 to the end. So let's turn our Bible to the book of Isaiah chapter 40, that we will be reminded our God is not only the creator who possesses intimate power and counsel, but he is a personal shepherd for you and I. And he desires today to comfort us. Because especially during the quarantine, this pandemic is prolonged than well, we expected. And we can be impatient and we can be discouraged and we need hint and the dose of comfort from our God. So that's what we are going to read. We are going to read from verse 1 through 17, but we are going to also try to uh, know what God has been speaking to us uh, through prophet Isaiah in entire chapter 40. Now verse 1, comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Be comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make a straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, Cry out, and he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers at the flower phase, because of the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with the strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with the young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with the span and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has taught him? With whom did he take counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket, and are counted as a small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its beasts sufficient for a burnt offering. And verses 17 altogether, all, all nations, nations before, before him are, are as, as nothing. nothing. And And they they are are counted counted by him him less than than nothing nothing and and worthless. And I think we, during this pandemic, because of coronavirus, that we can see before God, the nations are like a drop in a bucket. And also, they are counted as nothing, even less than nothing, because all countries are shaken up by little this virus. And every nation is confused and lost and devastated. And before God, if God moves with this one virus, that entire world are just scattered and lost and totally devastated. So according to the scripture, we can see magnitude of his power in negative way. But in a way, to me, his glory has been revealed even during this pandemic. But... As God allows this discipline to his church, so we've been hearing the messages of conviction. We need to purify ourselves as the bride of Christ has been defiled with a compromising lifestyle. 
So that has been a message we've been hearing, that we need to humble ourselves because God has been humiliating this nation. So we come before God in repentance and asking God to purify our hearts. But at the same time, God has been giving us messages of conviction. But I believe, and God at the same time wants to comfort us because after this pandemic, we may though expect greater persecution and the, the generation and the world will become darker and darker. But as a people of God, that we can anticipate greater future and with a great hope. So that's why even as God used the prophet Isaiah with a message of conviction and repentance and judgment and wrath of God has been displayed, but also from the same mouth of prophet Isaiah, God said, raise your voice, cry out, say to Jerusalem and to my people, comfort my people, comfort my people, says the Lord. Whenever God says it twice, the same phrase, it's emphatic. Just like Jesus multiple times would say, Amen and Amen. And he would say, oh, Surely, oh, surely, I say to you, he who believes in me will have eternal life, and so forth. And just like that, that in the midst of God's wrath, in the midst of judgment, in the midst of purification, that God wants to comfort us. So today, that we may hear his voice comforting us. And because even during the time of prophet Isaiah, he said, a comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem. The Jerusalem city will be ruined and people will be killed and people will be led as captives to the Babylonian kingdom. But he says, cry out to her that her welfare is ended that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand a double for all her sins. What God is speaking to his people is that for the future, in mind of Messiah, because when he comes, your welfare will be ended. And also, surely, after 70 years of captivity, God will bring his people back to Jerusalem. And your sin is pardoned. And as he has said that, and we know in our own time, by the blood of Jesus Christ, all our iniquities and transgressions and sins have been pardoned. But not only that, we hear how gracious our God is. Listen to this. For she has received from the Lord's hand double for her sins. What God is saying is, your iniquities are prevalent. Your transgressions, your rebellion, and disobedience are abounding. However, as much as your sins are so great and much, but my mercy, my forgiveness, my grace, and my love will return back to you in double portion. So I will repay your sin with a double of my love and power and grace and mercy. And that's how that I want to comfort you. So I believe genuinely this time of quarantine is, is a truly blessing to at least to, to Christians, even though that we can adopt this pandemic as a punishment, as a chastisement and discipline of God because we've been rebelling against God and that Everything that human invention has been abomination before God. So that's why God scattered us as if God has judged us as a Bible tower. But as a Christians, I believe this is a time of true blessing. You know why? Because just like Jesus took three of his disciples to the mountain of transfiguration, Below the mountain, people were confused because there was a demoniac boy and they tried to cast the demons out of him, but they couldn't. And they're lost, they're confused, they're agonizing. Just like that, this world with a demonic called coronavirus, people are confused and people are inflicted and people lose their lives and the governments and the leaders are all confused and people don't know what to do. This nation is utterly broken up. 
But as followers of Jesus Christ, we can utilize at this time of quarantine and follow Jesus and go up to high mountain and be able to see the glory of Jesus. Not only he himself was transfigured, that his face, his clothing shined like white light but us as well we can enjoy that intimacy we can be able to see the glory of god so i believe this quarantine can be treated as a time of us ascending into the mountain of transfiguration and there we will encounter jesus there we will hear the voice of god this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased and listen to him and as we are empowered and as we encounter Jesus such a powerful way, the due time will come. Even though in our own eyes, pandemics seem to be prolonging, it will get over and it will be ended. When that time comes, we will come down from the mountain and transfigured, transformed and changed and renewed, ready for new wine. And we will be able to minister these people still confused with the demonic, still lost and still weary and don't know what to do. And we, after this uh, transfiguration, will be able to minister the world and nations and our neighbors and the people. The gospel message will powerfully penetrate into the hearts of the people. And that's how God, I believe, is uh, comforting us. And that's why here, in the Bible, chapter 40, verse 6, the voice said, cry out. And he said, why should I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because of the breath of the Lord blows upon him. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. The word of God. That Jesus spoke and Jesus' life becomes true life for us and true comfort to us. So even though this in quarantine situation, that everything will fade, everything will wither, us, even people, with their beauties will fade away. The word of God will be consistent and perpetual and forever will stand. And that's why. During this time of quarantine, we can have and experience a mountain of transfiguration, meditating His Word, and from His Word, this story itself truly comforts us. And even though this pandemic seems to be prolonging, it will get over. It will be done. And His Word, His promise will perpetually stand. You know, out of many, many promises, that God has given to you and I as our shepherd. One of the promises that I continue to hold on to, and it has become such a powerful comfort in my own personal life is, and also during my prayer life, is the book of John, chapter 14, verse 14. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So many times when I remind Jesus of that promise in my prayer time, Jesus, you said, if I shall ask anything in your name, you said you'll do it. Jesus, do it. Father, listen to my prayers as I pray in your son's name. And when I plead with God with that promise, the comforting promise, sometimes immediately that I sense he's a strong presence and immediately that I feel like that I am brought nearer to his throne that that I feel truly that God is listening to my prayer. So this time of pandemic it can be we can be easily discouraged and disappointed and a God's word will not wither, will not fade away. And with the upholding of his promise, meditating and grabbing and memorizing and claiming his promises before God, God will continually comfort us. You know, many of us have uh, read the book, Five Love Languages, written by Gary Chapman in 1992. I think that book revolutionized 
our marital relationship, recognizing each person has a different degree, a way of love language. But you know, the five love language words of affirmation that God uses that to comfort us with His many, many promises. And then let's look at other love languages acts of service, quality time, physical touch, and giving, gifts. All these five languages, yes, these are applicable in human relationships. But, you know, if we apply these languages to our God, that's how God expresses His love to you and I, to His flock. That's how God comforts us. First, with the words of affirmation. And, you know, I don't know about you, Whenever I receive a gift from our church members, I feel loved and respected and appreciated, and I become humble, and I, I really become thankful and with the different kinds of gifts. But I don't know about you. For me, I open the cards immediately. The words of affirmation, the words of comfort and encouragement, you know, recognizing how they that you are being our spiritual fathers and things like that, that it truly brings comfort and encouragement and builds me up. And I believe every one of us is like that. But when we receive a card, simply saying, may God bless you, you know, we get a little bit disappointed by that. So our God, with the words of affirmation, He continually comforts us, but also other Languages he uses, for example, acts of service. So obvious. Jesus said, I came to the world not to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. He washed the feet of his 12 disciples. He continually served. His body was so tired. He didn't have any place to lay his own head. But he said, continually serving other people. That's what our God does, acts of service, to love us, or to comfort us, and then quality time. Are we kidding? Much more than our desire, our Father, our Shepherd desires to spend the quality time with you and I. He longs to converse with us. He longs to enjoy and share intimacy. And not only that we desire to be on His lap, hearing his voice, sweet voice. But he said in the Bible, just like as we read, that he wants to carry us in his bosom. Of course, he expresses his love in quality time. And then, physical touch. This can be a little bit tricky. Our God expresses his love in physical touch? Yes, absolutely. When we receive a healing, physical healing, that's a hand. That's a finger of God touching our body, removing illness and sickness. And many of us have experienced the miraculous healing. And my children included. Not only that, more than several times, I will physically feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Upon my head, sometimes I will feel like a heavy hand laying upon my head. Physically, this is a physical sensing that I'm sensing. And the big oil of his anointing, I feel like, comes out of my forehead and descends down. And then I know I'm filled with his anointing and the Holy Spirit. And we shouldn't seek such a physical, tangible experience with God that we become easily superstitious. But God, if he desires can express his love and comfort us by physical touch and then by also giving us gifts. Are we kidding? Every time we pray in the name of Jesus, financial provision, protection, he gives us his blessings and our lives can be also food or prosperity. So with the five love languages, he comforts us and he expresses his love towards us. You and I. So my conclusion of that book written by Derek Chapman is these are five languages are God's language. They come from God. And we utilize them in our human relationship to edify and to strengthen our 
relationship. There's another way God comforting us. Many of us, as we grow older and older, we realize life is not that easy. Life is tough because still Satan is controlling this world. And we go through different sufferings and pains, unexpected events will really put us down. And also our own failures, our own shortcomings and iniquities will invite such entanglements in our life. So sometimes some people want to give up in life. That's a reality. But God knows what we go through and how we feel. And he wants to comfort, comfort us. Not only he uses the five languages, but also he uses people in our own circle. It may not be word of affirmation, but by show of their own life, brings comfort into our life. How does he do that? Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 five, through 5, that's what he said. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. What does he mean? He means the church and the Christians in Corinth, they went through great sufferings and trials and even persecutions. But Apostle Paul, as we know, he went through enormous sufferings and pains in his life. He was stoned multiple times. He was robbed and he was shipwrecked and he was beaten multiple times. And many, many persecutions, hatred, and despisement from other people. So he himself suffered great trials and persecutions. However, he himself received comforts and consolation so that he became the agent of comfort to the church members of Corinth. That's what he was saying. So when we look around our life, we will always find some brothers or some sisters who have gone through similar trials and pains of life, but they receive the comfort and consolation, even restoration and healing from God. And when we observe them by their lifestyle, it brings us such comfort and hope in our own life. That's why I as a lead pastor of this ministry, can be some degree comfort to our church members because I myself also suffered consequences of my failures, consequences of my sin, my shortcomings, and also trials and pains and sufferings of life. For single brothers and sisters, you've been waiting for God to show you or bring about your future spouse and you may have been waiting for years. I myself, too, waited until I became 39 years old. Perhaps that can comfort you because now I can humbly and confidently can say by the grace of God that we've been living happy and healthy and strong marriage and the family life. And that's God's consolation to my life to encourage and comfort those people who've been waiting before God. Those people who came out from broken families and the fathers and mothers were not so perfect and there were abuse and a lot of conflict. I too come from such a family, was not totally divorced the family, but yet still my father and my mother truly wrestled all their lives and I observed. But now with God's comfort and consolation, that I have a family that is 180 degrees different from my childhood. And that can bring the comforts to those married couples or the families or even are afraid for future families. And 
What about people who are wrestling with addiction? I too was an alcoholic who couldn't go to sleep unless he's a fully drunken, suffered with the insomnia for many, many years, and I became naturally alcoholic, and I was addicted to porn and any other things as well. But by the grace of God, God not only comfort me, brought consolation, but also restoration and freedom. And with that, I may be comforting agent to those who are wrestling with any bondages and addictions. And there can be many, many more in their lives. So we do have a God positioned in our lives who can be a comforting agent. But more than that, you, yes, you, who are wrestling with addiction, who are wrestling with the family background, who are wrestling with the wounds and scars that seem to be perpetual, who are wrestling with the marital conflict, who are wrestling financially, poverty. Are you kidding? All these, you will be comforted. You will receive a consolation. And you will receive a restoration from God so that you can be the comforting agent for emerging generation, the younger people who are rising up and facing difficult challenges of life, and by observing your life, how God redeemed you, naturally, you will serve them as a comforting agent. So have a hope. Be comforted. Every single trial and trouble and problem of life, there's a reason to it. And we don't end in the trouble themselves. We always come out and become agents for comfort and consolation and restoration. So shepherd, our God, wants to comfort his sheep, which are you and I. Then second thing that we can learn from this chapter can truly comfort us is to understand God's power and His infinite knowledge. Particularly, when we read verse 11, He will feed His flock like a shepherd, reminding us God is not only the Creator and the Lord and Master, but He's our shepherd. He will gather the lambs with His arm and carry them in His bosom and gently lead those who are with the young. But on verse 12, that reveals His infinite power. Amazing, beyond our wildest imagination. We cannot fathom the degree of his power. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? You know what the Bible is saying? Even here on earth, we have a vast oceans, Pacific oceans. Have you been to Santa Monica? Have you been to Huntington Beach? Can you see the endless, the horizon, the boundary of Pacific Ocean? You have an Atlantic Ocean, and then there are numerous lakes and rivers. All these waters, God puts in in the hollow of his hand. That's magnitude of his power. And not only that, the Bible says, measured heaven with a span. We know from the scriptures, the sky that we look at, it's just the first level of heaven. There's a second and third heaven. But only let's imagine the sky we see, first heaven. The Bible says he measures it. All the sky that we look at, when we go to India, when we go to Israel, when we go to Turkey, we look up, it's endless sky. The Bible says how powerful our creator who is our shepherd he said in his span he measures it span is at the, from the tip of your thumb and tip of your little finger that's a span and he measures all this sky and first heaven second and third heaven with his span and then he says and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighted the mountains in scales and hills in a balance, calculated the dust of the earth in a measure? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Absolutely not. 
Let's even talk about sand at the seashore. There are thousands, millions of beaches here on earth. And also in the desert. Can you number its gravel? What God does. God does the exact number of each gravel of sand from the beach and from the deserts. And not only that, and my background as well. There's a particular scientist. His name is David Blatton. He wrote a book called Spectrums. In his book, he said he gathered some professors and scientists from the University of Hawaii because they wanted to count the number of sand here on earth. Of course, that's a blurry estimation. But he said, imagine each gravel, the size is the same. And you put the gravel of sand into a teaspoon. And then you multiply all the beaches and the deserts. And they came out with a number. Of course, this is such a blur estimation. 7.5 times 10 to the 12. I don't know how to even say it in English. Did you know there's a vocabulary called a sextiron with a number 0, 18, or 24, something like that? Billions, or trillions, or quadrillions, and something like that. That's the number of cents. Their own wild guesstimation. But God counts every single one of them. That's how infinite counsel, knowledge, wisdom, and power he possesses. That's not it. In the book of Isaiah chapter 40, we didn't read this. Verse 26, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He's talking about stars and galaxies. He calls every single star and galaxy by name and by number. He can count them. And by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, he calls none, one is missing. He calls, when he calls all the stars, not one hides herself behind the scene. Everyone, star, has to come out. And then David Blatton again, and also other, other astronomers say the number of stars in observable universe, meaning what we can observe in the universe. Typically, with the barren eyes, they say we can see about 3,000 stars in dark night, moonless and clear sky. And with a telescope, you can probably see, they say, about 100,000 stars. But in reality, in observable universe, they say there are about 100 billion stars in each galaxy. But there are also billion and trillion galaxies so they came up with the estimation of number of stars as one time 10 to the 24th. The gravel was a 10 to the 12. This one is a ten, double. The stars that we cannot see with our physical eyes, double of estimation of the number of sand gravel. And God has each star its own name, and he can count them. Amazing. Beyond amazing. But what also it strikes us is that although one times 10 to the 24th number of stars are in the skies, but that number is equal to 10 drops of water. The number of H2O molecules in 10 drops of water is the same number as the stars in the observable universe. That just blows our mind away. Only 10 drops. No wonder God said, as we read, the nations are like drops of water in the bucket. To him, nothing, less than nothing. 
what it amuses me is this. In each own body, us, you and I, about 60% are contained in water. That's much, much more than 10 drops of water. With a grown-up male, they say there can be between up to 11 gallons of water in a grown-up male body. 11 gallons of water is a lot of water, much, much more than 10 drops of water. You know what that means? In our own body, we carry H2O molecules that are much, hundred thousand times more than number of stars in the galaxies, in one's own body. That just blows my mind away. And that's just a little bit of scientific proof of what kind of infinite power and knowledge our God possesses. But what it amazes us even more is this. That God, that amazing creator, is mindful of you and I in the universe. That he cares for me. He knows every single thought. He knows every single feeling. He knows every single minor and major situation of everyone's life. And he comforts us and he loves us. And he wants to give us the best and the greatest blessing. That is such amazing. I don't know how to describe in human words. And then what he promised to Abraham. When he was still childless, his body became just like a dead corp being almost 100 years old. And God took Abraham out and said, look at the stars if you can count them, that I will make your descendants as many as stars. Are you kidding? 10 to the 24 zeros. When he was childless, when his body was almost dead, and then he said, if you can count the dust, gravels of all the sands here on earth, that will be your descendants. And not only God has been keeping that promise to Abraham, even until today, more number of people are being added to Abraham's family in Christ Jesus. You know what that means? You know what that means? That means we can dream big. We can dream big. No matter how much we widely open our mouth to him, he will not be shocked. He will not say to us, you know, Shine, John, you know, Eric, uh, that's a, too much. Never. To him, it's a less than water in a bucket. He can still fulfill it. That brings, a, I don't know about you, tremendous comfort. So young men and women, church members, brothers and sisters, dream big. Our God is a beyond the gigantic God. And if he can count dust, he can count the stars and name them all. And every single one of them, he overrules and controls. And he loves you. He's on your side. And he wants to bless you for his glory, for his kingdom purpose. And lastly, if we read from verse 27 through 31 in chapter 40, we realize God the shepherd empowers his sheep. He, with his infinite power, he is willing to lay part of his own power to strengthen us, to renew us, to empower us. And that's such an awesome truth. Verse 27, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. We complain this all the time. Why, God? Why, Lord? Why do you allow this pain in my life? Why this? Why that, God? You have forgotten me. I don't feel you. Why this pandemic? Why aren't you moving? Why aren't you healing? 
My just claim is passed over by my God. People despise me. People wrong me. I'm being mistreated. But God says, have you, have you not known? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the God, the creator of the ends of the earth? Neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He doesn't faint. He doesn't become weary because he's working all the time. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't take a nap. He's all for you and I. And he says, he gives a power to the weak. He empowers the weak. And to those who have no mind, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. Just because you are young, just because you are youth, you think you will not faint or weary? Absolutely. And even young men shall utterly fall. Don't trust your youthfulness. Don't trust your young strength. You may fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with the wings like eagles. You know, eagles can fly up to 100 miles upon hour, faster than our race, our cars and the highway. His wings can stretch like eight feet long. He foresees two miles away his prey. God said, I will renew strength those who wait upon me and mount up with the wings like an eagle. His promise is, I will empower the weak. How often do we feel weak? In the Bible, we have a fool of people who've been weak. Rahab was a prostitute, unknown woman from Jericho. But God used her to fulfill God's plan. And because of her, her entire household got saved. And her name is recorded in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Tamar was the same way, losing her sons. Asiba, fallen into adultery with the king, will begat Solomon. Moses, who's so old, no longer, he can walk properly, but he has to reuse rod all the time. Became the greatest deliverer in human history, bringing two million Israelites out of Egypt and led into the wilderness. A shepherd boy became the most famous king of Israelites' history. He was a weak and last son, unknown, rejected, rejected son in his family. When we are weak, we are strong. When we are weaker, he becomes stronger in our life. During this coronavirus pandemic, many people became weary. I cannot imagine. I sympathize, especially with the mothers. They're stuck with their children all the time, 24-7. They need to be friend and provider, cook, and do the laundry, everything. You become weary. But God says, young men will fall. Youth will faint and weary. But I will strengthen you. And those are people who will wait upon the Lord. It doesn't matter, regardless of your age, your mantra rings like an eagle and you will fly and soar. Our shepherd empowers the weak. Our shepherd strengthens the weary. Our shepherds renew the waiters, those who wait upon him. And during this quarantine, as we wait upon him, going up to the mountain of transfiguration, following Jesus, he will change us. He will renew us. He will transform us. He will empower us and strengthen us and will cause us to now go back down from the mountain and we'll be ready to serve the world, our neighbors, and our nations. Let's all rise. In this world, weakness is a shame. And you will hear people 
rarely confessing, I'm so weak. But in God, weakness is a boast. Because when I'm weak, He's a strong. Because our God is the shepherd who comforts the weak and strengthens the weak. You know, as a preacher, sharing the God's message twice is very challenging. It's not because that I have to do it twice. It's because to ushering the same level of anointing for both the services has been always challenging. You know why? Because I'm first service, I'm humble, so I'm weak. So I confess before God, God, when I'm weak, you are strong. So I feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit as I speak His word. But during the second service, my heart is already lifted up. Only 30 minutes later, between two services, there are only 30 minutes break. And my heart has become content already. And during the second service, it may be the same message, but my reliance on the Holy Spirit is diminished. Why? Because I'm already relying upon the experience of first service. So even the content may be the same, but anointing is a lesson. That is a struggle. And then sometimes first service, I feel like the message was so lousy and I'm broken during the break and I fully rely upon God crying out to Him, God, I'm so weak. Help me. And then during the second service, Holy Spirit kicks in and I'm energized. You may not recognize this, but I recognize this every single Sunday. Maybe perhaps the praise teams, they may experience a similar thing. But what I learned this experience is this. Weakness is not a shameful thing. When I'm weak, I become relying to God 100%. And my weakness induces His strength, His infinite power in my life so that my life becomes miraculous so that I don't give a credit to myself but to God and I glorify His name. So my weakness becomes my boast, just like Apostle Paul said. Humility is a choice. God, because we did not humble ourselves, decided to kick in and began to humble us in this season. God's comforts become so evident for those who are weak and broken, poor, and contrite. God truly comforted me with the chapter 40 of the book of Isaiah. I hope God also did for you. And I encourage you to go back to chapter 40 and meditate and hear the voice of the shepherd. Because Jesus said, my sheep hears my voice. And he will truly comfort us. This quarantine is a time for us to be on the top of the mountain of transfiguration. And we can see Jesus with another dimension of himself transfigured that we may be able to see his glory and by his word of affirmation he's comforting us come to me I will give you a rest let's call the name of Jesus three times and pray God I don't seek comforts from the people I don't seek comforts from material things but I directly come before you to be comforted. Comfort me. Heal me. Encourage me. Lift me up. Build me up. Empower me. Strengthen me. And renew me. 
Let's call his name and pray. One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for being our shepherd.